Thank you, everybody, for coming out today, this afternoon. My name's John Kaiser, and the topic of my talk is emerging discoveries. What is an emerging discovery, you might ask? Well, an emerging discovery only exists in certain time periods, very bearish periods, where what is normally immediately recognized as a discovery only undergoes a modest blip even though evidence that this is the beginning of something big is staring you in the face. And because I think we're still facing a catastrophic market decline and possibly a very deep recession, I didn't really want to focus on companies that have ounces in the ground or are simply poking holes at targets that have yet to deliver evidence of a potential discovery. So the five companies I brought in today they're all companies that in the past year, I've observed something in the results that tells me this is really, really interesting and all it will take is more work to show that this is the beginning of something big. And uh, I'm gonna to explain today why and how I think this situation is what it is. So there's, the blue is kind of where our market is rebased to uh, uh, how the Dow behaved starting in 1920. And you can see the Dow after a kind of COVID-style crash in 1929. It had a rebound, and then it faded, and we entered a period of uh, you know, fascism and, and Stalinism and all kinds of terrible things. We're actually at a strange point where democracy is under siege again, and we are seeing the world divide into autocracy and democracy with Russia and China forging the alliance. And this is reversing the process of globalization, which is going to become a driver of inflation a lot longer than the uh, Federal Reserve ho hopes. So here's what the, the uh, uh, IMF predicts for GDP over the next while. And, and we're right about here. And yet now we're facing a period of rising interest rates. And that generally does not make GDP grow. In fact, it makes it go in reverse. And Russia, China together represent 22% of GDP. Uh, China's the second largest. Uh, Russia's actually in 16th or 17th place with the United States in first place. But they account for 40 per more than 40% of global supply for over 19 key metals. And those are all the ones I've highlighted they're in yellow. If this split accelerates, and you know it will because Russia has said weaponized natural gas, it's going to try to bring Europe to its knees. We will see this split widen, and the threat is there that China will say, enough of this nonsense, Taiwan is officially ours. And the American response uh, is, cannot be, oh, okay, we always knew it was. Let's get back to business as usual. So a lot of stuff that we think uh, comes from anywhere in the world, it's not going to come anymore. And this scarcity is going to be a source of inflation. And uh, the reshoring talk is now accelerating. Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan was kind of a wake-up call to the manufacturers. Just start moving your productive capacity out of China. You can pick other parts of Asia. You can pick America, uh, uh, Canada, Mexico, but get it away from China. And they were already thinking that because uh, China has skewed the playing field to favor domestic companies over the foreign companies who are there and tolerating all this because they see the huge Chinese market. But Xi Jinping, who has made zero COVID a symbol of the superiority of autocracy, he's worked the Chinese economy into a potential tailspin by itself. And if this Russia-China alliance continues to accelerate, global trade will change dramatically. There'll be some company, countries which form alliances with the, uh, the autocracies. There will be others that, that won't. But China's own economy is potentially vulnerable to an implosion. So being there with a government that favors the domestic companies, how strategic is that? But re, re, removing your productive capacity costs capex, and it results in opex that is higher. So there's an embedded inflation in goods that's not going to go away no matter how high they jack the interest rates. 
And the metal markets are anticipating this. Look at all these price declines that we're seeing. And yet, look at the warehouse stocks. They're the lowest that they've been in an extremely long time. And I showed you the GDP projections, which are probably going to have to be, be revised. But we're dealing with the largest economy ever in the history of the world. And the metal markets are saying there is real bad stuff coming. And they're anticipating it ahead. And that's really tough for the junior sector. You've seen all the, the majors and juniors uh, sell off in the last while as they sort of say, ooh, this, this is going to be bad. And for the juniors, what's happened is that uh, speculative interest has disappeared from the market. You don't want to touch an ounce or pound in the ground feasibility demonstration play at this point because when, it, when, when, when the interest rates start to go up, as they did here, the economy is going to be crushed. The real estate pyramid uh, is going to uh, fall apart. Uh, there's going to be a reverse wealth effect that makes money disappear. Crypto will probably evaporate. Gold in this inflationary environment will also come under pressure. So um, the, the outlook for anything that depends on a higher metal price, it's, it's very poor at the moment unless some miracle happens in Russia. Uh, Putin gets kicked out and everything goes back to some globalized, uh, globalized normal. So in the first sort of 15 years of my career, the juniors that I specialized in, they didn't, special, they didn't deal with uh, advanced projects. They would explore to discover something. And when they did, they had a fantastic uh, uh, play in the market. And it would get bought out or farmed into by a major who would develop, to develop this project. And that's where also the biggest money will be made. Now, Hemlo was born in the pit of Folker's bear market that he created. Uh, there'd been a tremendous spike in venture trading uh, in, in, the, in the 79, 80 period when, when gold went way up. But then it all crashed and was totally dead. And yet Hemlo was born out of this pit of a bear. And then, then we had another sort of recession here, and SK was born out of that. And then there was a slump again. And then ECADI was born with a little slump afterwards. And then Voise, Voise's Bay. And then we had a period where the, the China super cycle came in. And yes, there were some world-class discoveries, but it was a feasibility demonstration game where it was the higher real prices of metals that pulled in the money and that turned the failures of past exploration cycles into new success stories. So the same sort of exciting dynamic was not present during that, uh, that bull cycle. And in the last bear market, which started 2012, uh, there was a stock, Hermosa Taylor, or, or, or Arizona Mining, which had blown $40 million trying to demonstrate the feasibility of an open pit oxide resource, had started uh, drilling deeper into the base and were coming up with with uh, 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 copper, zinc, uh, silver sulfides. And they were good numbers. And, and I'd watched this during 20, 2015 and didn't do anything about it. And, and then when I was talking to Bob Wares late in the year, in, in October, he said, you should take a harder look at this. this. This is incredible what they're coming up with. So I did and turned it into a bottom fish pick at the end of 2015 and then uh, into a formal recommendation uh, in January of 2016, because all this data was staring at us. The discovery was already happening, but only Richard Wart, the, the CEO, was busy buying, buying the stock. We're in this type of window where the bearishness, the unwillingness to believe results lead to anything except crappy results afterwards, this, this is the kind of window that we're in. And Hermosa Taylor, I mean, this is probably my the most spectacular pick that I've ever had because I was the only person who talked about it and actually gave the rationale for how this works. And I call it outcome visualization where you start footprinting the, the system, imagining what kind of mine it's going to be, put the numbers together as if it exists, and I have this whole model, rational speculation model, which uh, shows you what the fair value is as the project progresses through the the, the stages to its final final fruition. And then, of course, the beauty is the S-curve, also known as the Lausanne curve, which is the peculiar tendency that when the market awakens to a new discovery, 
because we don't know the limits of how big or how rich it can get, well, somehow magically end up pricing it at a valuation where the implied project value ends up being worth what it is at the end of the day if it is indeed a success and is ready to go into production. And of course, this, this dreary part down here during the feasibility demonstration stage shows that uh, that's where it sort of goes back with the rational thing. And then you never know how long permitting and all that will take. But it is this part here, which is the exciting part of the junior exploration game. And we are in a window now where it pays to read the results, to ask about the geological context. Is this just drilling some vein down dip? Or is this part of a big emerging new story? And you know, another thing that's changed is this was sort of our last big boom cycle here when uh, the uh, TSX Venture resource listings dominated traded value. There were only a couple short-lived periods in 2016 when we thought we had a turnaround. And again, in 2020, during the COVID, COVID shutdown when gold uh, charged through $2,000, and, and then that slumped again. Most of this time, non-resource listings have dominated. But since December, we have now had the longest running period where resource listings have dominated traded value on the venture exchange. Now, that's not because there's a huge amount of money pouring into this sector. Uh, you can see the value traded has actually come down. It's still not as bad as this horror show in here, but what's happened is the non-resource listing, the interest in cannabis, crypto, and all that stuff, it has evaporated. And the reason I'm focusing on emerging discoveries is if you're ever going to get risk capital back into this resource junior sector, it's going to come from these emerging discoveries taking off because they're validating the initial indications. And once you're in a discovery play, who cares what gold is doing tomorrow or, 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 or next year or copper or whatever, because a discovery is defined by grades and intervals that work at the metal prices that you have. They're not premised on higher future prices or anything like that. It's based on what you have. So you can ignore all the macroeconomic predictions about interest rates causing a recession and everything, demand for raw materials to go down, especially because it takes five to 10 years to bring any new discovery into production anyways. And any discovery, resource discovery, it's not like a Tesla where it can be worth a trillion dollars or so. No, there's a finite limit to what a mine is going to be worth. It has a mine life, it has an optimal processing rate, it has an NPV, you can actually calculate it. And so the upper limit is low enough that it takes only a fraction of the capital pool out there to pour in to create the S-curve. So, the first company I'm going to talk about is Can Alaska uh, Uranium, and they've been in the exploration business in the Athabasca Basin since 2004, and I've even had to do a rollback somewhere along the way, and they've assembled a huge portfolio of properties, much of it on the eastern flank of the um, Athabasca Basin, where, where, where all the mines are, are located. And their flagship project has been one called West MacArthur, which is what you call projecting the trend of an existing known trend into, say, deeper ground, uh, or deep, deeper target area, and drilling and drilling. And they've spent a lot of money on it, but this year they had a breakthrough. And that breakthrough was when they went in here and redid geophysics, they saw that the old drilling along the south conductor, it, it was actually misplaced. They drilled in the wrong place. So even though they had the right concept, the data was not right. And these types of high-grade uranium systems, and you can see even the 2.4% 2, 2, uh, 2, 2, 2 interval is $2,700 rocks. That makes gold look like a joke. And at the 3.5%, at the it's $4,000 rock. So these uranium deposits in the Athabasca Basin, these are like hyper gold plays that you mine underground at relatively small scale and have huge cash flow uh, potential from. So now we're sitting here at this thing. They have one interval, 100 meters beneath the unconformity, which is 800 meters deep. So they're drilling, you know, 900 meters, 1,000 meters with an angle, angled hole. And uh, 
and, and it takes time. And the markets, even though the context is such that these other ones look like this, and they have grades up to 6%, and that market's saying, we don't, we don't believe, we don't believe this is real. The stock did double, but that was, it basically doubled back to where it had been financed last year. So you're getting the benefit of this extra information and the follow-up drilling for basically what the people who were hoping for a discovery hole were paying in October last year. And in the case of uh, you know, these uranium mines, there are several uh, economic studies out there, such as the Aero deposit of next-gen energy, where, where the data's there, you can look at it. I've done an outcome visualization, and if they come up with something like this and are able to, to mine it and, and make it become part of existing capacity on the eastern flank, the NPV of a deposit at the current price of whatever, 52 bucks a pound, you're talking about a $4.3 billion outcome, which if they didn't have to do more dilution, you're talking about a stock price north of $20. That's the kind of action we, we used to uh, uh, see in, in the juniors in the old days. And, and of course, in rational terms, it should not go there right away, but then there's the S-curve. So I'm suggesting that if they start to demonstrate that this is another Eagle Point, heaven forbid that it's another MacArthur River, you're going to see S-curve action come in a big way for this little junior. And there you can see the, the, the feeble market response back to where it got financed over here. And this is sort of saying, well, suppose it's rationally valued now, you still have an upside target of about uh, you know, $15 if they deliver. However, if you think this is S-curve peak valuation, well, then it's just going to go sideways. And some of these big puffed up stocks that are hoping to repeat Fosterville and that and, 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 and Newfoundland and that, these are ones where if they eventually deliver, it probably won't be worth that much more than what they're already valued at. So the VR resources, uh, Hecla Kilmer, this is an emerging rare earth story. And uh, Mike Gunning went to that James Bay Lowland region looking for IOCG systems. And these, these, these intrusions, they're visible from mag data. They've been seen 20 years ago from the, from the big regional surveys done. They've been checked out for, for kimberlites. Uh, some of them turned into a, a carbonatite Niobian deposit, such as the James Bay deposit of, of Nio Bay. But none of the others seem to ever deliver anything really interesting. Uh, Olympic Dam model is a relatively new one. So, so VR decided, let's start checking, checking these out. So it's kind of like going back to grassroots area with a new model concept and start drilling, drilling these targets. And what was interesting is what was supposed to be a copper gold type target has morphed into a rare earths niobium target. And the rare earth situation, this is kind of like, you have to do a lot of work like I do to put together this sort of data to see that the, the rare earths, when we had the little blip here and all that uh, in 2009, we had the first rare earth bubble. Uh, the, the future demand growth is now happening. Rare earths are an intrinsic part of the EV sector. And if they're yapping about replacing ICE cars uh, with EV cars by 2035, just like we need 10 times more lithium to make that happen, and why lithium is, I think, a, an extraordinary discover, exploration discovery type, uh, type target, target metal, the same applies to rare earths. But China dominates the, the that dominates the, uh, the, the rare supply, even though others are starting to come into it. The problem is the prices are kept, are relatively artificially low by China, which ends up overproducing, which is a strategy to keep other deposits elsewhere from being developed. But now that this axis between Russia and China is becoming explicit, autocracy versus democracy and globalization fragmenting probably into different trading zones, we have to think really hard, where do our rare earths come from? And I think a lot of these projects in, in, in Canada, they are going to get a lot more attention than they recently have. Now this one caught my attention for an important reason. It is a carbonatite type system at Hecla. Kilmer, but most carbonatites are higher grade, 
you know, 4% for Bayer Noble and 8% uh, for Mountain Pass. And uh, the problem is they have very little heavy rare earths in them. They're very poor. Now, neodymium and praseodymium are the key rare earths in these deposits. They you know, count, count for like 80% of Bionobo's value and uh, similar, even more, 90% of, 90 of Mountain Pass's value. But the terbium and dysprosium, which is needed to keep the uh, magnetism from decaying at higher operating temperature in these permanent magnets, it's part of that heavy rare earth suites and it doesn't exist in these types of deposits. So what was, I became, first I was interested uh, by the results that uh, uh, heck, uh, um, VR reported earlier this year. What was before just below 1% intervals, yeah, not very good, not very interesting. Carbonatite probably you know, can't compete against these, these monsters elsewhere. But then they started reporting additional results and gave us the distribution. When I plotted it up, I discovered that this has 8 to 10% heavies. And that's unusual. That's because it's a mix of different minerals created by the uniqueness of this particular setting. And hole 13 is a discovery hole because it was 240 meters of 1% uh, within which there was 65 meters of 1.5%. So once you're above 1%, you're suddenly in the game. And at the time, this a week or so ago, a couple of weeks ago, that was over $400 rock. Now, the, the overall prices will probably go up in the long run. But what's important about a discovery like this is if you put this into production, not only do you get your neodymium and praseodymium from a North American mine, but you also get the byproduct, the heavy dysprosium and terbium as part of it. So this is much more interesting than a simple carbonatite that only has light rare earths in it. And the market hasn't really recognized it. I mean, uh, VR is now doing a dilutionary financing because they know they have a winner. They need to keep drilling it. And it's an opportunity now, this company that's uh, been beaten up in this market and not rewarded, it's another emerging discovery staring in your face. And they also now have a handle of what they think is the controls for the higher grade uh, mineralization within this huge four kilometer wide complex system. And that's what they're going to be targeting. We'll be looking for 10 million ton plus zones that are open pitable with this 1% plus grade, grade preserving this uh, 8 to 10% heavy rare earth enrichment. Co Copper Lake Resources that this Marshall Lake project that they have has been around for 50 years. The main deposit, 2.2 million tons, it was found uh, or, or at least uh, delineated in the early 70s. And there's been this 40 year process of trying to find more either deeper along strike or repeats of it. But because of limitations to geophysics, the maximum this entire property has been Swiss cheesed is to 300, 300 meters. So the interesting thing is the company frustrated, hired Don Hoy as exploration VP early 2021. He did a digital compilation, gave them the bad news that there probably really isn't anything left to be found shallower than 300 meters. So let's use newer geophysical techniques to look deeper. And from this, emerged first a deep IP anomaly, something much more substantial than that associated with the billetin deposit. Then they drilled it, and of course they drill into the guts of it and get nothing, except they intersect something interesting higher up, much higher silver, copper, zinc grades than are in the billetin deposit themselves. So now, they, now that they've spent money getting this deep hole down there, they do a down, a down, down hole EM probe, and they start seeing their stuff around it. So they say, okay, let's do a large EM, a large loop EM survey over the general area to get a bigger picture of it. And they end up with all this sort of plate type stuff. And, and they look, yeah, yeah, with, with, uh, un, 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 unlike uh, 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 Can Alaska, which uh, with its first hole spears the whale, uh, we managed to somehow spear everything but, but the whale that's, that's down there. And so now they're set up to, with a program that's got these targets much better refined. And even better, they've now come up with a 
evidence for a plausible model as to what is the geometry of this whole system. And the old bulletin is now perceived to be part of this stringer. And the, what the guts that are the, all this high conductor center is the VMS pile that supposedly is rich in copper, copper, zinc, silver, and, and, and probably even gold. So now it's below 300 meters, so it's deeper, but we have all the evidence of a, a, a major discovery that's perhaps one hole away from validation. And how were they rewarded with all this? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of excitement in the beginning when they thought they might hit a Kid Creek or something like that right away. And uh, now they are in the process of doing a financing. So endurance gold is probably the, the one I've been following in Alfred's covering the Reliance project for, I'm in the third year. And they also did a rethink of an old project that delivered some high grade, that, but that never amounted to a hill of beans. When they got hold of it, they said, they didn't really approach it. This is, it's a big, juicy system, but it's got complex geology. So they've been working their way through using different methods to slowly build an understanding of what's going on. And it's not far from Vancouver. They can work year-round. They just added this big land package because they think what's happening here might repeat itself several times, as suggested by what's going on over there. And they have a program of uh, doing fur sampling in here to, to see if there are some other arsenic and rich stripes in there to put boots on the ground. But the main focus is this corridor, this 300 meter wide now, almost two kilometer long uh, structural corridor with gold all over it. And they're just beginning to understand. And this came out a week ago. This is the first structural model they've attempted to to, to show what they think is going on. And the nice thing that's emerged in the last while is the targets earlier were shallow dipping uh, gold zones that daylighted in the northeast direction, but would be cut off by the thrust fault to the southwest. So you had tonnage limitation. Now they're seeing the vertical controls. This is an orogenic system. They can go down thousands of meters. They're much higher than Braylorn, where they have 4 million ounces of 15 gram per ton on gold that were, were mined out and which could be potentially present at, at, at depth. And again, so the, now they're, they're marching in this direction and eventually they'll be able to just go chase this deeper and deeper. They have an emerging model. And this again, it hasn't yet had that barn burner intersection which makes everybody say, holy mackerel, but they've got all this accumulating evidence that this is a rich system from which will emerge a multi-million ounce high-grade gold system. And here they've, uh, you can see, they at least have an uptrend going, but even with the latest results, they're just caught in this pall of negativity about what's going to happen to the market and economy in general. And again, this is the kind of window where you do your homework, validate the, what you know, the, Robert Boyd's going to tell you later, and place bets on these emerging discoveries now. And then the last one, Arctic Star. This, this one's an unusual one for me. And I decided to, to, to adopt it uh, as a bottom fish and an emerging discovery because my background goes right back to November 1991 when I was an analyst at PI and I was getting the old you know, fax machine news release and I saw the Diamet fax and it came off, off and I read it. And I said, oh, this changes everything. And it was really just a marginal, tiny, you know, meaningless news release. Today, that news release, people would you know, throw it in a trash can right away and totally, totally ignore it. But that began the whole Lac de Gras boom, where eventually the entire craton size of Switzerland was staked. And it changed the world diamond market. And it made tons of money for myself, for people who jumped into it. And it also created that sort of glass half full frenzy, almost 90% full. So crazy, you got one G10 garnet in your pail and everybody says, ah, oh, you've got the next big discovery coming. Now we're at the opposite end of the extreme where like uh, the glass is 90% empty and you take one more sip and that's zero and you're dead. So. Here's why I like this particular story. Chuck Fipke and uh, Stu Blusson and, and the BHP team tracked indicator minerals all over the place and ended up here and slowly built up this concentric land package. De Beers had been 
in this area before that through monoprost because they knew this was a thick keeled craton that had been stable for a long time is the place diamonds should be. And they had actually picked up indicator minerals uh, suggestive of diamond potential because they were the pioneers in this whole G10 chemistry. And so they knew there was a smoke all over. And of course they missed the boat because uh, <laughs> the little junior diamond figured it out, staked all this. So when they, when they saw this happening, they had the database and they figured, well, those guys have done their homework. Anything down here is just down ice from there. Anything down here, well, it's down ice from way, way, way over there. But we have chemistry here, and it's not up ice from there. So they staked that Hardy Lake block, and within 10 years had found two dozen or so kimberlites, half to three and a half hectare in size. Most of them were diamondiferous, but the definition of diamondiferous back then was, was like just in micro diamonds and with this crazy um, macro micro distinction in one dimension, whether it was half millimeter or larger, that those ratios proved to be absolutely worthless, uh, meaningless. It was only later until around 2000 that the sieve based system for classifying the counts as different sizes emerged as a tool to project grade. Now, now De Beers eventually Gave, gave up and let this lapse because it didn't see, none of them were good enough to take to mini bulk sampling for macro grade. The, the sizes were too small for them. They didn't see potential for standalone. 20, 30 years later, this thing, the, the Diavik, they've, they've looked and looked but haven't found more. This maybe has five to 10 years left. ICADI, they're now scrambling to find more, revisiting all these pipes to keep this alive. This is existing infrastructure that's hungry hungry for mill feed. So they don't have to find a world-class scale diamond cluster that's capable of a stand, sustaining a standalone operation. This is a different type of game. It's a rethink of it. And they've had success. They've managed to find five new pipes by applying a different type of geophysics. And, what's, and the sad thing is De Beers never published the data that it accumulated by this, even though under assessment rules, uh, technically if you do this work and then you, you file it and you give it to the public to reuse and try again, they are hoarders. They've kept all this data. So all these pipes will at some point have to be revisited. But Sequoia emerged. And the interesting thing about Jack Pine was Magiscore Jr. optioned it uh, back in uh, 2004 and spent a couple of years on it with a very onerous uh, 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 farming deal and then fin finally gave up because it really couldn't do much better than what De Beers had done. But Jack Pine plotted like this. When they drilled Sequoia, Jack Pine's here, and with this new type of anomaly that they tested, they came up with a very interesting curve right here. So you can see these numbers. This is what caught my attention. All of a sudden, here's a macro grade potential, which uh, in that model system over there suggests, you know, 20 to 50, 70 CPHT. Not good enough for like standalone, even with that size. But if the value of the gems is high, this could be a very valuable discovery. And in, in the 2000s, when the sieve based system came out, I actually finally had a tool whereby early stage results, I could predict whether or not there was any meaningful grade potential. I couldn't predict whether there would be quality potential. Uh, sometimes the quality was just poor. You had high grade, but, uh, but very poor, poor, poor results. And, and they've also discovered next to that Finley system that De Beers had explored, another little pipe called Arbutus with juicy looking core. Now, just because it looks pretty doesn't mean it has to have anything in it. They're awaiting caustic fusion results for that. Patrick uh, alluded to it in his presentation earlier. This could be coming next week. And they also have six or so holes into the sequoia. And what we're waiting for is validation that the initial intersection wasn't some localized fluke that isn't representative of the rest. So this company is on the threshold of suddenly being recognized as having one or two major new pipes, but it's the bigger context of the rethink of all this old information. Because I found an old paper on the internet by Barbara Scott Smith that discussed the results from based on all the, the magnetic uh, modeling. Uh, they said not all of the chemistry, the dispersal trains, 
is explained by what we have found. But they figure if there was something huge, we would have found it. So even if there's good chemistry left, we're coming from pipes that will be relatively small pipes. So, so De Beers, we walked away from this, and it became open, and the little junior staked it and is now applying a rethink to a play that perhaps was explored too soon in the exploration cycle by too big and smart a company to yield what's all potentially present there. And like there again, you can see the, uh, <laughs> there's no, not getting much joy, joy from the market for, for this uh, discovery. So again, an emerging discovery, and all these companies have lots of paper outstanding, so you can't mount a little pump and dump, pay some fake newsletter writer to like it, and, and then, and then uh, goose the market with some fake trading to build an uptrend, and, uh, because there's no liquidity except what you're selling to the suckers. No, these are stocks that will only go up because they have fundamental results that the market understands. And even when they come out, the market will still be slow to respond because it is in such a deep funk, expecting everything in the big picture to get much worse over the next six to 12 months than they already are. Thank you.